So um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning on behalf of Procter & Gamble. Uh, what I wanted to do today is talk to you a little bit about how Procter & Gamble is touching lives through application of technology, data, and analytics. Now, I was told that this audience is a fairly technical audience, so I'm going to get into a few technical terms, uh, and those that aren't technical, um, forgive me. But I, I do want to share how technology and data is helping power Fortune 100 companies like Procter & Gamble. Um, what we're gonna what we're gonna cover here? Okay, the controller doesn't seem to be working. Technologies okay is uh, is really uh, four topics. One is the application of big data to uh, the supply chain, how Procter and Gamble's applying big data to customers and consumers, and then lastly uh, the skills needed for success. Since we have a number of practitioners in the audience. Uh, I thought we'd share, at least for our journey, what we view is needed to be successful in this space. Uh, but before we get started, I want to do a brief survey. If we can turn the lights on uh, briefly, if we can turn up the lights. Everyone stand up and turn the lights on so I can see you. So Procter & Gamble is a large company, and I, I think uh, many of you know our company by our brand. So uh, what I'll ask you to do is when I call out a brand that you or a family member has purchased in the last 12 months, uh, go ahead and, and be seated. So this is going to be a market share analysis for our leadership team here in the front. So uh, Dodot, if anyone's bought the, the diapers, Dodot, go ahead and have a seat. Okay. Wow. See, all of our leadership's looking back. We don't have a large share here of this audience. How about uh, Pantene? Pantene, have a seat. Okay. Pretty good. How about Ferry? Ah. Ferry has a, ferry has a nice, nice market share here in the audience. Very good. Um, how about Gillette? Gillette, you or your, your significant other has bought Gillette. Okay. So we have about a 98.2% share of the audience. Thank you very much for the rest of you sitting down. So that's very good. So the so Southern Europe team, uh, leadership team here is in the front, and Sami and Franco, you, uh, you've done a great job here in the audience. That <laughs> was very good. So uh, Procter & Gamble is a very, very large company. I, I, I wanted to sh play a very short video just to give you a sense for P&G and what uh, employees at P&G uh, do every day. Please watch. There's volume. No audio? Okay. No problem. Okay, so we have a few technical difficulties. We'll, we'll, we'll go continue uh, beyond the video. The intent of the video is to show you the work that Procter & Gamble does across our brands every day. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time understanding our consumers in every market. We operate in over 180 markets around the world. We spend a lot of time on product innovation bringing the best innovation in our products to meet our consumer needs. Uh, we spend a lot of time marketing and communicating to our consumers. Uh, we touch 5 billion consumers every day with our products around the world, 180 countries, significant number of plants around the world. So we are, uh, we, we are a very complex, very large organization, and in order to manage this ecosystem that we have at Procter & Gamble, uh, data and analytics and technology is, is foundational to our, our work. 
So I'm going to proceed beyond the video if I can. Can we proceed beyond the video? Okay. So I'm going to be sharing a, a couple examples in the, commer in the commercial and supply chain space on where we are applying uh, technology and big data. Uh, we have a number of use cases. I've selected only three or four to share today. But uh, big data is a key part of how we operate this very large uh, organization that we have. So the first uh, example I want to talk about is in the supply chain. Procter & Gamble is recognized by the industry as being one of the lead supply chains in the world. So in this survey, uh, this is a little dated, but we continue to be in the lead. Apple and Procter and & Gamble and Amazon are listed among the top supply chains. We have an extremely complex supply chain. Uh, we use uh, data and analytics as a way to understand how to design our supply network. So if you think about uh, what it takes to produce a product from raw materials to manufacturing to transportation to ultimately getting the product onto a, a store shelf, that is a very complex process and data and algorithms are used to optimize how we, how we deliver products to market. We also use uh, 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 convolutional neural nets, which is a methodology uh, in machine learning to optimize inventory. For a company like Procter & Gamble and our retail partners, inventory is a very important metric that we look after. And so we optimize how, where we store our inventory based on demand signal and based on uh, what consumers uh, are, are needing and wanting across the markets. Uh, lastly, we have thousands of trucks that leave our plants every day. Uh, the logistics associated with uh, understanding what truck picks up what product and delivers it to what distribution center is a very complex uh, 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 network problem. We have uh, operations research experts that apply uh, optimization routines to optimize the synchronization of our transportation and our uh, material supply throughout the network. So we are very, very proud of the analytics that we apply to the supply network. Our network continues to be robust, uh, especially with e-commerce, uh, elevating the, the timeliness uh, that we need to deliver our products to the consumers. Uh, and, the, and the optimization of that process continues to be an area where big data uh, plays a significant role. I want to share a couple examples in the commercial space on where big data is applied to help make better business decisions. This example is from one of our developing markets in India, where in India we have these concepts of uh, high frequency stores. These are s stores that are maybe five meters by 10 meters so in size, rel relatively small. In these stores, we sell very, very small sachets of product, Pantene, and we sell single use uh, products. And there are 1.7 million of these stores in India. And prior to applying uh, algorithms to this process, the, the distributor who would go sell to these stores would go into the store and sell based on, uh, a, on, a, on a list. And that list wasn't the most intelligent list, it was uh, alphabetic order. So they would start with selling Ariel, and eventually they'd make their way down to uh, Pantene and other products. But it wasn't the most intelligent way to sell a product to the store because it didn't really incorporate the inventory in the store, and it definitely didn't incorporate the information about the shoppers uh, around the store. So what we did is we, we, we took all the sales history over the last 20 years, put it in a big data database, and surrounded it with demographic and psychographic information of the consumers that live in that neighborhood. And so we were able to identify through um, uh, uh, applications of machine learning and, uh, rec uh, and uh, recommendation functions, we've been able to rec recommend the top items that the, that the distributor should be selling to the retailer, and, and we, gave, we gave that to the distributor through their normal uh, distributor applications. What, what that resulted in is a much more intelligent list of products to sell, and we drove uh, an increase of, uh, of sales significantly by making the intelligence of the, of, of, the, of the distributor much more informed by a very large database in behind. The thing I like about this example is it's an example of how we've operationalized algorithms in how we sell to our customers. Uh, so the experience of the sales agent is really now made much more intelligent by a very large big data application behind the scenes, and their iPads are now just made a little bit uh, more intelligent with the insights from this application. So as you see, we've, uh, 
We've scaled it to 5,600 sellers, and we're moving to uh, other developing markets uh, around the world. This one is a, a, a more of a consumer example. Uh, we recently launched the Olay Skin Advisor, uh, which was really focusing on uh, addressing one specific problem. And the problem we were trying to address is that uh, if you go to a store and you look at the shelf, sometimes it's very confusing to understand what is the right product for you. Sometimes it's hard to understand what the product differences are. Uh, there's a lot of different products on the shelf, and it's especially in the beauty uh, aisle, it's a very complex decision that a shopper has to make to pick what's the right product for them. The other insight we had is that um, our consumers really want to make sure that they have a product regimen that is personalized to them. Especially in beauty, uh, it's really important that the products that they select are very much personalized to their interest. So what we did is we created an artificial intelligence application uh, using some very, very advanced uh, uh, methods to analyze the face. So all of you, uh, after you uh, leave this conference, can go on to Skin Advisor, Dot com and you can actually do this yourself where we have a, a, a mobile app that allows you to take a picture of your of your face that um, that picture is is analyzed across 10 million other anonymized faces and we analyze 250 regions of your face and that is a very very complex image recognition algorithm that's running behind the scenes to analyze all these zones of your face and then the application within three seconds will respond back on an analysis of your face so it will, it will talk about the very, very good parts of your face, and then there, it will talk about the parts that um, need help. And I think the pr we, we call it uh, opportunity areas. So you see in this picture, my opportunity area was underneath the, uh, the eyes. I clearly didn't get enough sleep. I must have been traveling to Spain or something uh, uh, the night before. But the idea here is that the, the algorithm identifies exactly where on your face or your skin can use the opportunity, and then it recommends the specific products that will help address your specific um, analysis. And, and th the nice thing about this is that the consumers that use this feel like it speaks to them. It gives them um, their, your skin age. The nice thing about this, and I guess it's because the data scientists all work for me, it made my skin age much younger than I really am, which I appreciate. But it gives you an assessment of your skin age, and then by applying these products, it should help you improve uh, the, the health of your skin. So this is a, an excellent example of how we've applied extremely, extremely sophisticated technology and algorithms. The data behind this is petabytes in size, as you can imagine, with all the images that we have to analyze. And then the technology stack required to, to process this in sub-second time is significant. And so the, there's a lot of technology behind the scenes to make this consumer experience what it is. Uh, I thought it's a very good example of how Procter & Gamble is using leading edge technology and algorithms to better serve consumers. And in this case, it's also uh, driving a significant increase in sales and conversion of, uh, of Olay. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the big data role. Since this is a, uh, a technical community, I wanted to talk a little bit about the skills needed to uh, be successful, at least in our experience, in the big data space. Uh, big data, for us is, a, is an emerging area that uh, simply we're able to do things today that we weren't able to do even one or two years ago. And the reason we're able to do this is because the, the cost of compute and storage has dramatically decreased thanks to Moore's Law. So every year the capability doubles, the cost goes in half, and year after year of doing that we're able to get compute and storage at costs that are now very, very feasible for us to process large, large amounts of data. The second thing that, uh, that's helped us a lot is the sophistication of the data science and the data engineering capability. We've been very deliberate in hiring those skills into P&G, and we're leveraging those skills across our businesses in the use cases I mentioned. So these are the four types of uh, big data roles that we have in the company. The first one is called Data Wrangler. This is all about data acquisition and data ingestion, so bringing the data into a single database. This is the most important role. And a lot of people like the algorithms, they like the analytics, they like the insights. In my world, this data management and data, uh, and data uh, ingestion is the, is the most important and critical role because 60 to 80% of a data scientist's time is spent managing data, harmonizing data. And all of us in, the w in, in this room that have done data analytics and even software development know that cleaning data and getting a proper data set is most of the work. 
And so data wranglers are, are critical uh, for the first step. The data scientists are the ones that do the visualization and do, do the advanced modeling. So we have uh, uh, 33 data scientists around the world. We have three hubs where these data scientists are doing very, very advanced uh, modeling, applying world-class uh, algorithms, for example, leveraging TensorFlow from Google for image recognition and a number of the advanced algorithms that, that we uh, work together with some, some other large partners. We do the data engineering. Uh, once we have the algorithm developed against the data, we need to scale it up. And so this is a combination of data skills and software skills to take the application and scale it up. So using the Olay example, we have, data, we have data wranglers that bring all the data together. We have the algorithm development to analyze the face. And then we have the engineers to actually create the application on the mobile phone to make it consumable to, to the uh, consumers. And lastly, all of this needs to run uh, uh, with, without a hitch. So the operations of how do you run this ongoing and every time a business user or a consumer engages with the application, it needs to work with performance so we have a data operations role as well. So that, those are the roles that we have at PNG. We have uh, Alpha where we go very, very quickly to develop something. We have some very large applications that we've, de we've developed in uh, two to three weeks. Uh, and uh, the reason we do that is we, we believe in uh, learning quickly, failing fast, taking the learnings and, and, and pivoting to find something that really uh, meets the business needs. So the idea of alpha development, we do uh, agile development like many of you in this audience to be able to get to a product that really makes sense. Then you go to a production where you create a, a prototype and then ultimately when you find a winner, you productionize it uh, in the ecosystem. So this slide really talks about the, uh, what is required to bring data science to life. So there's really three skill sets required, in my view, to be a really good data scientist. First is the mathematics and statistics. There's a very deep technical knowledge that you need on how to develop algorithms. And it's uh, the basic of statistics is foundational for all of my data scientists. And we need to understand the leading edge algorithms, which, by the way, with open source is, is, is innovating significantly uh, every day. The second area is computer science. So we have probably a number of computer scientists here in the room. The ability to take algorithms and data and create software that changes um, th how people make decisions is, is a really key skill set. And then lastly, um, the business uh, acumen. A at the end of the day, the only thing that matters in, in our space, even though we're a lot of technologists in the room, is that we're solving business problems. I'll share a very brief story uh, about uh, three years ago when I when I first became the chief data officer at Procter & Gamble, we had one of our large technology um, suppliers come to, come to my office and he brought 30 people and he presented me the big data stack. And this was a very expensive big data stack and he talked about big data for about 45 minutes. And at the end of the 45 minutes, their chief, uh, chief uh, technologist said, Guy, what do you think about our big data stack? And my response was, I can care less about big data. And you know, me standing here at a big data conference saying I can care less about big data is a little bit ironic and polarizing. And what I told him was, what I care about is big insights. And really the technology and the algorithms and the data only matter if you get unique insights that change the outcomes of the business that problem that you're trying to solve. And so I always encourage technologists to, to, re to recognize that data, technology, as sophisticated as it is and as important as it is, it is only a means to serve a business problem in the end. And if we lose sight of the business problem we're trying to solve, nothing, none, of, none of the stuff we do here matters. So the business acumen is critical. The insights we bring that are actionable to change the outcomes of the businesses that we're running is really why we're uh, all in the field in the industry. So that's, um, that's uh, the, the continuum of, of, of what, we, what it takes to bring da big data to life. I have a few learnings, um, the, the, last, the last one, and then I'll go to the learnings, is really about uh, the, the flow of data science work. This is typically uh, the process we go through in developing data science solutions. First, it, it's all about defining the business problem. We spend a lot of time co-located with our business, understanding what is the fundamental strategy of the business and what are the problems of the business we need to solve. If we're not clear at the beginning on the business strategy and the business problem, nothing else we do later matters. So we spend a lot of time understanding what are the decision-making processes, what are the fundamental business problems we want to solve. And we have a lot of uh, business 
uh, leaders who are very technically savvy, so they're excellent partners to engage in these kind of conversations to understand the business problem. Once we're clear on the business problem, we move to what is the data needed to solve the problem. And in s most cases, we have the data. In some cases, we don't have the data. So we either have to go make the data or we have to go buy the data. But we need to get access to the data to solve the problem. And we need to extract, we, we, you know, in, in the industry we call ETL, extra extract, transform, and load. So we need to bring the data in, we need to transform it in to, to make, uh, make sense for our business, and then we need to lo load it into our environment so we can actually model against it. The third step is actually applying uh, and developing the analytics and the algorithms. We have a, a, a sophisticated suite of algorithms, and in our experience, open source has been phenomenal. Uh, for us to be able to apply some leading edge capabilities very, very quickly. Uh, and then we do a lot of testing to validate that the algorithms are, are delivering uh, quality results. And then, uh, and then the last step is uh, we apply the algorithms to uh, get results and, uh, and ultimately action the insights that uh, these algorithms are suggesting. Uh, this is obviously a very important step because the best algorithms in the world, the best data in the world, if, if it's not actioned, is, uh, is useless. It's a, it's a wasted raw material. So we spend a lot of time making sure that the business understands it. Uh, one of the big challenges in our industry is this concept of black box. And we, I know we have a lot of technology vendors in the room. Um, my experience is black box does not work. Black box is, uh, y is, is this concept of we have a great technology and algorithm and lots of sophisticated stuff in here. Trust us, it works. That's called black box. And uh, black box, when you go to a business user and say, trust us, it works, and you're going to make multi-million dollar decisions on this thing you don't understand, doesn't work. And so the concept we, we, we apply is called uh, glass box. And so what we do is we like to expose our, our decision makers to the types of things we do to help inform decisions. Uh, and when we expose them enough and have them feel comfortable enough, then they b b uh, have enough trust and credibility in the algorithms to, to make decisions uh, based on it. So, you know, at Procter & Gamble, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, this is for the technology team. Digital at Procter & Gamble is everybody's role. Everybody at Procter & Gamble has a digital component to their role, whether it's technology, data decision making, or using analytics to improve their decision making. Uh, digital is pervasive across the company, and we need to help people understand how technology can be applied to, to solve, uh, solve some really real problems for them. A as I mentioned, on the data science side, we've uh, grown one and a half times uh, year on year. So we, we're growing quite significantly. Just two, two years ago, we had two people doing data science at Procter & Gamble. And we've invested significantly in the space because we're seeing the value. Uh, and we're laser focused on solving some very, very large uh, uh, challenges using machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, a lot of operations research in the supply chain space. Um, and then, uh, you know, lots of, we have hundreds of years of experience. Of the 33 uh, data scientists, I have 26 PhDs in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and operations research. So very, very strong capability, uh, but also people that are passionate about solving very, very wicked problems. At Procter & Gamble, we offer lots of complex, challenging problems to go solve. We give folks the most advanced technology to go solve the problems, and we have career paths that reward and recognize individuals for applying their mastery to solve those problems. So my final uh, slide is on learnings to date. Um, this is uh, of, you know, I've been in this field for over 20 years, and uh, these learnings uh, remain, uh, remain the case uh, now more, more so than ever. The first learning, as I mentioned at least twice in this talk, is ha you have to be business problem focused. If you're not solving a business problem, all the technology in the world and all the uh, data and analytics in the world is meaningless. So laser focused on solving business problems. Even though I'm a, a technologist, I'm a trained technologist and a data scientist, I view myself, myself as a business leader first who happens to bring deep technology and analytic expertise to the table. And all of us in this room, even though we may be software engineers, uh, developers, or, uh, or data scientists, we should all view ourselves in the industry as uh, business leaders who bring a, a, a depth of uh, technology expertise to the table. Shiny objects is a challenge in this industry. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times I hear uh, lots of uh, very um, 
uh, buzzwords in the industry. You know, big data is, is turning into a buzzword, and it's a very, very useful solution, but sometimes people don't understand it, so they follow what I call the shiny objects. So we have people that get very excited about wanting machine learning and wanting big data, and my question back to them is always the same thing. What problem are you trying to solve? In some cases, big data and uh, machine learning is exactly the right tool to solve that problem. In other cases, Excel and small data is, is perfectly sufficient. So my guidance to folks in this space is don't get over overwhelmed and, and, uh, and, and fall in love with all the shining objects. Be pragmatic and leverage the advanced technology where it makes sense. Uh, and there's a great capabilities th that exist in the industry to help us uh, solve some problems that we didn't solve before. The third point and part of my role at Procter & Gamble is to elevate data as a strategic asset to the company. Uh, many of us in the industry understand that data is going to be the new currency. Uh, in my view, the insights and the actions associated with analyzing data is going to create competitive advantage. Industries that do not look at data and apply to analytics as a uh, competitive advantage will be irrelevant in the next two to five years in my estimation. Every business will be a data and analytic driven business and you need the right uh, technology professionals and analytic professionals to power your business and leverage data as an asset. The last one is work process change. For me, technology and digitization, digitization is the most um, a game changing capability that we've had in business in the last uh, 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 decade. The opportunity, though, is to fundamentally change our activity system and how we get work done. So as technologists, our job is to educate and influence how work needs to change to really maximize value of big data in this case. So I'll share with you one very uh, specific example. We have a big data use case that has 1.3 trillion rows of data. It basically recommends um, uh, different products to be uh, stored on different uh, on the shelves of, 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 the, of the stores. We're essentially digitizing uh, how we think about store assortment. So the old process that we used in the past of um, gut feel, intuition, um, panel data, maybe uh, uh, analyzing 300 or 3,000 uh, shoppers, that is no longer relevant in this new world. I don't analyze 3,000 shoppers, I analyze 30 million shoppers in big data. And the amount of richness and insight and detail that you're able to get out of this very large database is step change. So we have to change our work processes to really be able to embrace these new technologies, be able to truly leverage them and be able to drive a, a step change in business outcome and a significant improvement in productivity. A lot of these technologies and analytics allow for automation uh, and the, 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 the focus of that work will be more on improving the algorithms and improving uh, how the data uh, flows. The lastly is this uh, three-legged stool. A lot of young analysts come to me and ask, you know, what does it be take to be uh, a successful analyst and eventually become a chief data officer? I, I refer back to the stool, which I, I mentioned earlier. These three legs are important. I have a lot, we have some folks in, in our organization that are extremely good technologists and data science algorithm developers, but they aren't very good at the business understanding or the communication. So they, they deliver value, but they don't deliver maximum value. We have other people that are very good at communicating, very good at talking the business and understanding the business domain, but they don't have depth. They don't have depth of technology of an and analytics, and, and, and many of us in the room who have studied it understand it takes years to achieve that level of depth. They are ineffective at moving the needle because they talk very, very high level and they're not able to deliver substance. The best practitioners in this space have all three legs. They have the depth of mastery, they have the ability to relate it to a business domain, and then they communicate it in a way that people can understand, and most importantly, can action. And so I encourage all of you to consider yourself in this paradigm and your organizations, and are we developing the future technologists and data scientists in our industry to have the three legs of the stool to maximize value for, for, your, for your businesses? With that, I'd like to close and say thank you very much for having me to this conference. Procter & Gamble is honored to participate uh, in, in uh, Southern Europe. We are doing some phenomenal things in, in, in the region to uh, apply a lot of these technologies. Um, we have uh, leadership, Sami and Franco and the whole leadership team here who are really looking at digitization as the future of how we're going to run our business. And we're always looking for a great talent who's excited to solve really 
large complex problems at Procter & Gamble and join our team to help us win in the future. So thank you very much.